Well, good morning, Emmanuel. I wanna welcome those in Richmond, Williamsburg, those online, and those in the room. It is an amazing kind of thing that we get to be a part of God's work, whether it's in Williamsburg where our building is being built or all around the world. Can we give it up again for God's work among the nations? Man, I'm so thankful. So thankful that we don't just send mission teams that go for a week, but we send people from our church to go serve for years. And so we have Lauren Nichols that is over there in Guatemala, and we also have two families that are serving in Europe. And so uh, we're gonna have a map up here. You can see where one of our teams is. They're currently serving in Spain for the week. We have some missionary partners there through the IMB. But it's this brown area that you can see in between Italy where the boot is and also uh, Greece. And, And it's amazing that Paul and Titus and a lot of other individuals did a ton of mission work in this area of the world. And we continue here in the 21st century to send people into the same area because the work is not finished, the task is unfinished. And so today we get to spend some time in the book of Titus. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. We're gonna spend time looking at the first four verses and briefly mentioning the fifth verse. But Paul is writing Titus because the missionary task is unfinished. There's still some more work to be done. And so he he goes there uh, previously he, he uh, does a lot of mission work in that area, leads some people to Christ, and then he moves on. There's another area in which Apostle Paul needs to go and share, but he leaves a young man by the name of Titus, and Titus was either someone that Paul, uh, God used to lead him to Christ, or perhaps they had a close discipling relationship with one another, but he, he tells them to remain there. The task is unfinished. Let's read together, starting in verse one. Paul a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior to Titus, my true child, in a common faith, Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. And then it continues in verse five. Here's the reason why Paul is writing to Titus. He says, this is why I left you in Crete, which is an island right off, it's kind of southern tip of Greece. It's in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea that you could see within that map. And he says them, so that I left you in Crete so that I might, or you might put what remained into order. There's some people who's come to faith in a couple different towns across the island, and so Paul is writing to him to make sure that work doesn't, isn't wasted. He wants to gather those believers together in order to instruct them, to teach them who God is, who they are, and what does God want for the rest of their lives? What kind of work that should they be involved in? And what he's looking to do is establish not just a church that's made of uh, brick and mortar, because that's not a church anyways. It's a group of people that he wants to help them learn how to live life as Christians. And so, this is where we start off. You know, some of us, we love to talk about order. Some of us, we love to have a plan. Some of you have a plan for your day. Some some of you have plans for weeks, years, and some of you are crazy enough to have plans for the next five years thinking that you can actually control it. And then there's others of us in the room who just go with the flow. Who are my folks that love to go with the flow? Listen, I'm not with you guys, actually. Y'all are the crazy folks here in the church. But, but here's the case. The Apostle Paul is a guy who likes to somewhat go with the flow. He likes to blaze a new trail, the Holy Spirit using him. But also, there's a man by the name of Titus who probably, to some degree, is, is better with thinking through how to organize things. And it really takes both in the missionary task. There needs to be people who are gifted with administration, but also gifted with faith. And both of them working together, man, can create an uh, amazing, amazing work. And so he writes to him. And and you know the opposite of order, the opposite of a plan is chaos. And some of you love to live in chaos, it's true. And another way of thinking about chaos is sometimes it's insecure. Whether or not it's the plans 
um, that's going on around the world or even with your family. If you don't have a plan for the week, you don't have a plan for the day, a lot of times you're gonna miss one another. There's gonna be miscommunication. All sorts of uh, difficult things can probably come up because you don't have any order to your life. But, but there is some of us in the room, once again, that can help with this and give some structure along the way. Here, Paul is doing that. So there's order that needs to be in the church. Chapter one is what Titus is talking about. There's order that needs to be within the family, and that's in chapter two. And then in the workplace and in other areas of influence, Paul addresses that in chapter three. But in the very first part, he really talks about the order of self. Who are you? Who are you? A lot of times, if a person doesn't know who God is, then they don't know who they are. And then if they don't know who they are, then their life tends to just be blown away by the winds moving to and fro. It's kind of like the the famous theologian named Beyonce. She says, your self-worth is determined by you. You don't have to depend on someone telling you who you are. And if that's the case, my friends, you are living in chaos. And don't think that just by merely singing her songs that you're not singing her doctrines because she is teaching you what she believes about God. There's another lady back in the 1800s. Her name was Emily Dickinson. And she was a Christian but struggled at different times just like many of us in the room. And during one portion of her life, she wrote a poem. And it it was, um, there's just one line that says this. I am out with lanterns looking for myself. I'm out with a lantern looking for myself. It reminds me of this individual uh, who was married to one of my friends. And they were married for a little bit of time and then all of a sudden she said, I don't even remember who I am since I've married you. And so I'm leaving. I'm gonna go on my own and I'm gonna go find who I am. And if after I find who I am, if I wanna still be with you, then I'll come back. And she left him. That's what this kind of ideology of you trying to figure yourself out leads to. It's a bunch of a mess, it's chaos. But Paul is very confident when he introduces himself. He knows who he is. Look in verse one, he calls himself a servant of God. A servant of God, another way of saying it is, I am God's servant. God owns me, I don't own him. I don't have him in my hands as a lantern, but the lantern actually holds me in his. But what does servant really mean? When you get down into this verse, what it's really talking about, and this this truth actually brings a lot of security to us, but this term is the Greek term doulos, which means slave. Now, when we look at what Christians are called across the New Testament, there's a lot of titles that we have received. One is a stranger, an alien of God. Another one can be branches on a vine or a sheep of a, of a flock, of the shepherd. Uh, sometimes we're even called Christian, but do you know how many times the word Christian is used in the New Testament? Three times, that's it. You know how often slave is mentioned? 124 times. But the reality is, is that when the translators wrote the, uh, translated the scriptures from the Greek, they wanted to make sure that people in our culture didn't think that God was some type of British or American colonial master of, of his slaves that kidnapped those slaves and threw them on the plantation and mistreated them all the way through. No, that's not what slavery looks like with Christ. Slavery is a wonderful thing because slavery to Christ brings about freedom from sin and freedom to obey. In Romans, we see that Paul says that you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness. There's no really per, there's no man out there that's that's really free. Even a Greek Stoic philosopher way back when, Epictetus is his name. And he said this, no one is free until he masters himself. And really what he was talking about is that all of us are slaves to different things. You can tell how your mind just drifts and goes back to the same old thing every single day. Some of us are slaves to Fox News or CNN News. Some of us are slaves to Bucky's. When you drive all the way to Lexington, you have to stop there, or at least your kids make you, which makes you a slave to your kids. You know, all of us are slaves to different things. And a lot of times, we're slaves to different bad habits. 
We're slaves to being angry, slaves to being rude, and, and to, to being anxious about every single thing that's going on in our life. And you know what? Jesus doesn't want you to be mistreated by the master of sin. And so he steps in and he saves us, purchases us, and sets us free from sin to obey. See, sin will lead to death. Sin always will lead to more shame, more guilt, more fear. But when Jesus gets a hold of somebody's life, he liberates them and gives them courage. He gives them courage to please God, to obey God. See, the Christian, he's willing to call himself a slave to Christ because he's not just free from sin, but he's bound to him. They have a deep love. Paul loved Jesus. And it was an honor for him to be called a slave. Even though in Roman, like Greco-Roman world, it was still considered to be a a poor thing, a a, a wrong thing for someone to be a slave. But also, slavery to Christ ends prejudices. You've heard it before, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. When all of us in Philippians chapter two, we see that Jesus humbled himself, not just becoming a servant, but becoming a slave, even to the point of death. And we are to emulate his humility. And so when we see that in Philippians two, all of us start to look at each other and measure each other up, not by the car you drive or the clothes you wear or what kind of accolades you have and your success, your achievements, but all of us look at each other through the lens of Christ's grace, what he has done. And so all of us are the same. And we all are sitting at a table of grace. You remember the prodigal son story that Jesus shared. How the the son He was fed up with being underneath his father's domain. And he wanted to go make a name for himself. He wanted to go figure out who he was. And so he said, Father, why don't you just give me my inheritance? And he went away and spent it on wild, crazy living. Then all of a sudden he needed a job. And so what did he do? He he found the only job that he could probably do was to feed pigs. And it didn't, it didn't, uh, feed him enough in regards to money. He wasn't making enough money, so he had to kneel down during a portion of it and start eating the same food that the pigs were eating. And then all of a sudden, he came to his senses. He realized he was a crazy man who had left his father. And he thought, man, my father's servants, not just his servants, but his slaves, my father's slaves have it better than me. And so he started to make his way back. Maybe my father will will not take me and let me eat at his table, but he'll send me out onto his plantation. Do you remember what his father was doing when his son walked up the hill? His father was looking towards him. He saw him and took off running, interrupted his son's apology and put a, a ring on his finger, a robe on his back, killed the fattened calf and celebrated because that's how Jesus treats his slaves. They are not just merely for his work, but for his own love. His slaves are his own sons that get to sit at the table of grace with him. I'm so thankful that he has secured us, provides for us. But it's not just that. He also picks us. You see this, an apostle of Jesus Christ Mark 3, 14 says this, and Jesus appointed 12, whom he also called apostles, that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. Now, Paul was not a part of those original apostles, but you know it and I know it. Maybe, maybe you've remembered the story where Paul is on the way to arrest Christians on the road to Damascus and all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in a bright light, takes him to his knees, blinds him, And Jesus tells another Christian or a slave of Christ, Ananias, hey, what I want you to do is go restore his sight and I want want you to inform the apostle Paul that I have chosen him that he might learn what it's like to suffer for my namesake. He picked us. He picked Paul, he picked the apostles and he's been picking people all throughout human history. What happened in the garden? He didn't form Gary, he didn't form Jerry. He formed Adam from the dust of the ground. You remember, out of all the wicked world, he chose a man by the name of Noah and his family. Now we know Noah was a righteous man, but there's no way he was perfect. And God chose him, told him to build an ark, and it was through that ark, through God, that their lives were delivered. 
God chose Abram all the way back in the Old Testament in the midst of a wicked pagan nation. And before Abram ever heard about this God, man, God knew Abram and he was working. He didn't choose Ishmael, but he chose Isaac, the one who was younger. He didn't choose Esau, but he chose Jacob, the deceiver, the younger one, the mama's boy in the mix. He didn't choose He didn't choose anyone else in Israel to deliver the people of Egypt except Moses, who was running away after he had just killed a man, buried him in the sand, and lived his life as a coward for year after year. He called his people out of Egypt. He delivered them over and over throughout the Bible. Man, he he tells these people, listen, I didn't pick you because you were great. I picked you because I'm great. Because God is a gracious God who wanted to save his people and to display his grace to them. You know, King Saul was the people's choice, but he chose that young little boy that nobody was looking at, tending the sheep. He chose David. And we're part of that. You know what's wild is in a Roman slave market back in the day, Masters would line up the slaves and they would pick based on the positive attributes of the slaves. If there was a man that was bigger than another, then more than likely, that was gonna be the one that was gonna be sold for more. But you know, God is the only one who chooses his slaves with the full knowledge of their weaknesses and their failures. You know, back in middle school, I had this wart, right? Had this wart, everybody loves talking about warts, right? I had a wart on the very tip of my elbow. And man, it was so small and insignificant. But there was another wart that I had on my hand that I wanted to get frozen off. And so I thought, well, might as well go ahead and freeze the other one. And listen, they promised me that it would go away and they lied. They lied, that wart came back with a vengeance. It grew bigger. And then they shot it with uh, some type of medication. I don't know really what it was. And they told me that it would handle it. But it ended up bubbling up. And it was nasty. And one day, I remember in the middle of eighth grade, I think it was history class or reading class. I can't remember. But, but I put my elbow down and I felt that bubble burst, y'all. And you know what comes out of a bubble? Pus. And everybody loves talking about that word, right? Just kind of makes you cringe. Like, please stop. And you know what? I didn't want anyone else to notice what the wart had done. I didn't tell anybody even about it when it was small, right? And so I remember as a middle school student wearing long sleeves and and hoping to God that they would find out a solution to this whole wart that it went from a speck to now covering like most of my elbow. But you know, most of us in the room, we're ashamed of our sin. We have skeletons in our closet because of the things that we've done but I want you to know it's not just what you've done that's the skeleton. My friends, all of us were a skeleton. We were dead in our sins. We had spiritual pus that looked like nothing worth someone even spending a lick of time with us. And yet God chose us when we were spiritual nasty pus to become his own children. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God who loves us, loves us, y'all, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world, that's us, to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So thankful that God loves us, not because of our performance, but in spite of our performance. He continues on. This is, he writes in harmony with the faith of God's elect, which is his chosen people, and their knowledge of the truth. This word knowledge is not a knowledge that you gain by experience, like street smarts, but it's a a knowledge that is obtained through book smarts. This term is kind of like looking at a topic like a, a diamond. It's kind of looking at a diamond. You, know, you don't just get satisfied by looking at one side of it, but you want to look on the top, you want to look on the side, you want to look on the bottom, you want to look over every single portion of God's truth. And that's the kind of knowledge that God wants for me and you. He, he doesn't want us to, to learn about the gospel of Jesus with a kindergarten education and then move beyond it. 
But he welcomes us to, to jump in depth into the wonderful truths about what God has done. Yeah, I think of, I think of this. We're, we're having, right now, it's called 30 for 30. And for the next 30 days of the month of June, we're asking that every single person that calls Emmanuel home, that you would spend your first 30 minutes in God's word without doing anything else. Maybe you get that cup of coffee, but that's it. You try to go ahead and let your family know that don't, don't try to interrupt my time. I know there may be significant things in the morning, but wait until I'm finished spending time with Jesus and then we'll go on for the rest of our day. 30 minutes for the next 30 days. We're encouraging you to do that with the Lord. Maybe this will be the longest amount of time for the whole month that you'll spend in God's word. Just imagine the amount of diamonds in the rough that you'll be able to discover about how much God truly loves us. There's a book that IBC kids across all of our campuses have been encouraged uh, to, to purchase. And this is a book written by Levi Lusco, which sometimes comes on the radio um, for a short amount of time on, on K-Love. But he's, he's written a book that uh, our leadership would love for your kids to supplement with your family devotions that you're going through throughout the summer. There's also 1451, which represents one week for the next 51 weeks. And that is an amazing experience for sixth graders through 12th graders to really dive deep and to learn more and more and more from God's word while doing it with other friends and having a lot of fun while you're doing it. You know, if you're a student or you're a parent of a student, man, I wanna encourage you to go ahead and make that decision and go ahead and sign up today because we don't need to just look at the Bible as some old book that we look at on Sundays and perhaps on Wednesdays. But it is our food for every single day. It's not just for our time alone with God, but it's for all of our time with God throughout the day. But this knowledge of truth, it accords with godliness. It should move beyond just book smarts, it should move into our life. And so when we read 1 Corinthians 13 and it talks about love is patient, love is kind, it's one thing to know it here, but it's another thing to live it here. God wants his people to know him, but also to live for him. And so it takes knowing doctrine, studying God, but also learning to live it out in your life through duty. But it's in hope of eternal life. That's what Paul is writing to Titus. He doesn't have his confidence in his own working ability and his own intellect, but he puts his confidence in the eternal life that God has promised. Many of us in the room, man, our, our moods swing like the current of every single day. Many of us, we put our hopes in things that just come and go, come and go, and I'm with you. I've done it many, many times before. But this is a hope that doesn't just fly away. It, it remains steady for us. It's the eternal life. This hope is not just being hopeful, but it's hope filled. Hope is a confident anticipation of God fulfilling his promises. And why, why do we have confidence that God will fulfill his promises? Look at the next line. It says God never lies. Aren't you thankful for that? Man, there's so many people who break their vows. They break their promises to you. But God never does. You know, when did he make these promises? It says before the ages began. The ages began is like chron chronological time period. And so I don't know if you knew it, but God doesn't exist in time. He exists outside of time. And so before he even created the world and set it in its motion, he existed all eternity past and into eternity future. And before he even created Adam, he made promises. He made promises of eternal life. You remember these amazing truths in Revelation 13, eight, before the foundation of the world was even formed, it says that Jesus Christ was slain. You know, Jesus didn't make his decision to go to the cross in the garden of Gethsemane. He made it before creation, he made it before the fall, he made it all along the way, he was committed. Also, Ephesians 1 tells us that God chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In Philippians 1, 6, God began a good work in us that we, he will bring to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. 
So God, outside of time, before Adam is even born and fashioned in the garden, he makes a promise that he's going to rescue you. Amazing, as a Christian, to realize that God has been working even before I ever met him, ever knew about him, that God was keeping promises all the way through. But at the proper time, God decided to manifest his word. Do you see it in verse three? At the proper time. There's a specific moment in time when all of us as Christians, God manifested his word. He displayed who he was through preaching. Now some of us, it's through preaching on Sunday morning when you came to faith. Sometimes maybe it was in vacation Bible school or you had a conversation with someone on the street or your parents led you to Christ in your car or your bedroom or something like that. But in that moment, God was working. It wasn't just the preacher. No, he's behind the preacher doing the heavy lifting all along the way to help us to see Jesus as he truly is. Do you remember when you came to faith? Do you remember when he opened up your eyes? I was over at Hopewell Baptist Church, uh, a preacher that's still preaching today, I believe. His name's Herschel Walker. And man, that guy had a passion that I had never seen before. He would sing, he would dance, he would preach loud, and he would cry, and he would spit, and I was like, who in the world is this guy? But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit was all over him. And I sensed it as a young man sitting in this area in one of the pews. And I started feeling the the world of sin that was on, placed on my back, feeling conviction of sin. I felt the fear of the Lord. Do you remember that feeling? Do you remember when you were, you were made aware of your brokenness, that no matter how other people viewed you, you knew you had those warts that were trying to be covered up by your long sleeves. But yet then I, I remember him telling me the gospel about how Jesus loved me in spite of all of my warts. That, and that he wanted me and it compelled me so much so that I couldn't even wait for him to end his prayer. I took off running. I took off running to the altar and, and fell down. It was, I, I didn't have anybody lead me in a sinner's prayer of any sort. I was just broken. I was trying to, realizing that I'm this finite creature, creature trying to interact with this infinite God who controls all things, trying to call out for mercy, mercy, mercy. And you know what? He granted it. He gave me mercy. Because God doesn't just keep his promises. He shows up. And he shows up every single day of our life. I'm thankful that he does. He reveals himself, comes to us in our greatest need. You know, my, my kids were involved in a dance recital this weekend. And as uh, the kids were, were leaving with Lindsay going on, they were gonna beat me there to, to go ahead and get some seats. I was waiting for a babysitter from other kids. But um, one of my kids made the reference, like, hey, you know, you have to be there at this time. She wanted to reassure me that I need to keep my promises to her, keep my vows. And I, I kind of laughed it off. I'm like, you know I'm gonna show up, but, but in, in her mind, maybe I wouldn't. And I think sometimes we're a little bit like that. As we're walking as Christians, going through different things, we wonder as the lights are on and the whole room is dark, whether God is there with us. We've read it time and time again. Yeah, he promised this, he promised this, he promised this, but still, yeah, I know, I know, I've heard God never lies, but is he gonna show up this time? You know, I remember sitting in that seat and when um, the, the dance, uh, you know, one of my daughters came out and she, she looked at me eye to eye and, and she saw me and she lit up. And you know, that's what happens when we realize that God shows up all the days of our life, on the good days, on, on the bad days, is when God reveals himself, we light up. And we're able to serve him 
slaves of Christ, being secured by him because he picked us. And he also demonstrates that he keeps his promises by always showing up. It's his work that brings us out of insecurity and places us on a firm foundation. It's, it's him, it's him, it's always him. He is the good news for us. So application, students in the room, which is all of us, Christians, oh, study the depths of God. Become amazed and enriched. Taste every ingredient at his table of grace. Study his word, not just 30 minutes in the day, during the morning, but even in the evening. Oh, make it to be the where, you never waste your time on your phone, but you always wanna be feasting and more and more and more on his word. Skeptics in the room, oh, why? Sometimes a question like this is thrown out when you think about the sovereignty of God and the human responsibility. Why should I choose to follow Jesus if he didn't choose me? What a question, what a question. Let's let Charles Spurgeon, uh, a, a great famous preacher back in the day in England, share his thoughts. I have no question that God chose me. How can I be so sure, you may ask? Because I believe in him and Jesus Christ as my savior. I could not have come to this belief on my own. It can only be explained by the power of the Holy Spirit and God's grace at work within me. And so let me ask you, who may not know if you know Christ, do you want to be freed from sin and be bound to him? Do you want a new master? Rather than having a master of sin, you want a master who's gonna take care of you and love you all along the way, helping you become more and more like him. Oh, come to him. And if you come to Jesus, he never will turn you away. So thankful for those truths. And then for the Christian in the room, oh, man, swim in the depths of his grace and these truths that he, he secured you, picked you, keeps his vows to you, shows up for you. We should enjoy it. We should swim in its depths. We should hike to its ends. We should climb to its heights. We should savor every single bite of knowing of what Jesus has done for us. And by closing today, what I wanna do is give the same greeting that Paul gave to Titus, to you Christians. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Will you stand as we pray?